Today I am going to perform one of the most famous pieces that has ever been written for the piano, and I find it kind of interesting that Beethoven not only has Fur Elise, which is one of the most famous pieces ever written for the piano, but he also wrote Moonlight Sonata, which was also known as Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia, and that of course is one of the most well-known piano pieces that has ever been written. When many people think of the piano, not only do they think of Fur Elise and a few other popular pieces, but they also will often think of Moonlight Sonata. And everyone knows the piece, everyone is familiar with it, and if you don't know how the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata goes, you've probably been living under a rock, because almost everyone on this earth knows how that piece goes. It's really, really amazing. But when Beethoven wrote the Moonlight Sonata, he had a bit of a problem. The piece wouldn't have been as well recognized as it is today if the first movement hadn't been so slow and somber and beautiful. But the problem he had was that traditionally sonatas don't have a slow first movement. The first movement is usually briskly paced too fast. And so if he came out with a sonata that had a slow first movement and also broke a few other rules of what makes a sonata a sonata, there was a potential for him to be considered a fool. So what he did, it was actually kind of genius, is he named the sonata Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia, which basically means sonata that is like a fantasy, or as one of my piano teachers uh, likes to consider it, Be Beethoven basically said, this is a sonata, or whatever you want to call it, because it broke many of the rules of what makes a sonata a sonata with the slow first movement and a few other things. So Be Beethoven kind of made a little workaround and he made a disclaimer saying, hey, I wrote a three-part piece that is sort of a sonata, but it breaks many of the rules, so if you don't want to call it a sonata, go ahead and not call it a sonata. Now the name Moonlight Sonata was actually not um, by Beethoven. Beethoven didn't call it the Moonlight Sonata. Other people kind of came up with that term. Some people said that it sounds, you know, like distant music or distant thoughts of some kind of a spirit. Or I've heard many different versions of what the piece sounds like to them. Depending on the mood I'm in, I kind of think of different things. When I first learned the piece years ago, I learned it during the summertime. So sometimes when I sit down, I can, I can feel the summertime. And other times I sit down and I feel a rainy day or something like that, which is the day we have here. So that's kind of why I feel a rainy day. It's not raining, but it's cloudy and kind of icky. So sometimes I feel like a moonlit night when I play this piece. I don't feel like it, but you know what I mean. I feel like the piece is expressing that. So the piece can really have a wide range of moods and feelings depending on just kind of how you're feeling, and it's a really, really famous piece, a really beautiful piece. So without any further ado, let me get into performing it, and I hope you enjoy.
So hopefully you guys enjoyed that performance of the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, or as it was originally called, the Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia. I forgot to mention in the earlier part of the video that the name of Moonlight Sonata actually came from a German music critic and poet who, five years after Beethoven's um, passing, wrote that the movement the first movement of the piece reminded him of the moonlight shining on the waters of Lake Lucerne, and that is kind of where the name Moonlight Sonata took off. People liked that uh, idea, and so then the name Moonlight Sonata became synonymous with that piece, as well as the other two movements, which in the future I will perform as well. Now, if you guys are interested, in just a little bit here, I'm going to bring the sheet music in here, and I'm just going to talk about a few of the things that if you want to learn the piece yourself, uh, if you already have and you want to kind of take another look at it, or if you want to learn it for the first time, I just wanted to talk about some of the things that might make the piece a little bit challenging, some of the things you'd want to watch out for, and just some of the things that, yeah, you'd want to watch out for. So let me get the sheet music out here, and let's do that, and hopefully you guys enjoy. So as far as tricky things go uh, in the piece, you know, things in the piece that might be a little bit tricky, there's not really a whole lot to talk about because as a whole, this piece is actually extremely easy and it's extremely easy for a few reasons. One of which is it's very, very slow. There's a, a few different tempos that you can play it at. I think the accepted range is around 50 to 60 beats per minute is where people usually will play it, which is pretty slow. And so it gives you a lot of time to think about the notes that are going to be coming. If you're reading the sheet music, it gives you a lot of time to read the sheet music, look at the note that's going to be coming up, and then you have enough time to play it. So actually playing this piece as well as memorizing it, since the harmony is really rather simple and it pretty much all makes a lot of sense, uh, it's actually a really simple piece. But there are a few things I wanted to talk about and the first thing I wanted to mention is that if you can't play an octave, I have some bad news for you. And that bad news is that you're not going to be able to play this piece because practically everything in this piece, not all of the right hand, but a lot of the right hand and pretty much all of the left hand is octaves. Now an octave on the keyboard is from one note to the next note that is well, an octave higher. So you have C here and then the next C, that is an octave. And many people can reach that with one hand. Some people can reach up to like a tenth like that, but many people will actually have a difficulty reaching an octave, and if you are one of these people that has small hands and can't reach an octave, then unfortunately you're not going to be able to play this piece. Now one trick that people like to use when there is a stretch in music that they can't reach with one hand is they will kind of break up the notes, so instead of playing them both at the same time, they'll play one before the other so that they can, instead of stretching to the whole span of the interval, they can just play one note and then go to the next, but that's not really going to work here with all of the octaves in this piece, because if you play it like that, it doesn't really work. Kind of, but it's a little bit strange. So like technically you probably could play the piece, but it's going to sound a lot different than if you play the octaves normally. Now if you can reach an octave but you can't reach a tenth, you will be totally fine in this piece. There are at least two instances, instances in the piece where a tenth is used. There's one here at the uh, first measure of the third line here, and then at the end of the measure there is a tenth in the right hand. Right here. Actually it's a ninth, sorry. It's a ninth. But basically if you can't reach that ninth, you can do the the rolling or the breaking up of the different notes there and it will totally sound fine. See that? Works totally fine. And I think years ago when I first learned this piece, my hands were a lot smaller and I couldn't reach a ninth, so I used that rolling technique quite a bit in this piece with that. And I think there's a few other spots, maybe they're in the third movement I'm thinking of, but I know there's a few other spots where you have ninths and possibly even tenths in the right hand, but I think mostly just ninths. So as far as other tricky spots in the piece, there's not really a whole lot to discuss because as I said, the piece isn't really tricky. What you should definitely pay attention to though is the dynamics and the expression that you want to put into the piece. There's lots of really, really subtle dynamics which probably aren't gonna be coming in on the recording that you listen to because they're really, really subtle. But for example, on the second line here of the second page, there are little dynamics. Um, there's a crescendo uh, at the beginning and then a decrescendo at the end. And so then the middle of the measure is gonna be slightly less louder than the rest of the piece surrounding it. If I play this part and I kind of exaggerate that effect, you can kind of hear what I'm talking about here. Let's see. Oops, hang on. Ah. That's, there we go. Quiet crescendo. Get a little quieter. Oh, 
I was really exaggerating that and you wouldn't actually play it quite that extreme in a performance, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what that would sound like if you increase the intensity there of the dynamics. But we have a lot of stuff like that throughout the piece. There's very subtle crescendos and decrescendos, but for the most part, the entire piece, actually really the entire piece is quiet. One final thing I wanted to mention about the piece, I'm just gonna take a look here at the third page to see if there's anything I wanna mention, which I don't think that there is. And that is the fact that it's very important to bring out the melody with your right hand pinky and in some measures in the left hand as well. And this was something that when I first learned the piece many years ago, my piano teacher taught me how to do. And I found it very strange at the time, but now it's really rather easy. What you wanna do is you want to, I'm just gonna go back here to the first page because it's the first part where you encounter this. You wanna be playing the chords in the, 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 the right hand and left hand quietly and then bring out the melody like that but keep the chords quiet which might take a bit of practice to keep that the, the single note there in the right hand louder than the rest but not also make the other chords louder. You don't want to be playing like this. Here are the other notes get louder too. I'm exaggerating a bit. You wouldn't play that loud anyway. You want to have that melody be the, the one thing that rises above the rest of the chords and becomes the melody. that. You can just focus in on the melody line and follow it above the rest of the chords. And these chords are quiet here. And then more melody kicks in here. I'm not going to play too much more. I just wanted to give you an idea of how that melody goes. But that's probably one of the most important aspects to get of the piece besides the general feeling and the flow of the piece and the way that just the, the chords and the harmony all flow together and you, you, you want to have that soft, gentle, kind of a sad kind of a sound, but you also want to make sure that that melody is singing above the rest of the chords and just sounds very prominent and that you can easily follow that melody line along with your ear. You don't want it to be blending in with the rest of the chords either like this. play it about the same volume. You can still hear it, you still know it's there, but you want to bring it out like this. Hear the difference? Hopefully you can hear the difference there. But that's about all the potentially difficult things about this piece that there are to pay attention to. Overall, the piece is really rather simple. As I said, it's slow, which gives you a lot of time to think about what's going to be happening next in the piece, and it's very, very easy and simple to play. So hopefully you guys found this little uh, look over of the piece to be helpful. So yeah. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the performance as well as the kind of look over of the piece. I People seem to enjoy what I did previously on the piece that I did before, which was for Elise, where I performed the piece and then talked about some of the things that you would want to watch out for in the piece if you go to learn it. So I thought I'd do something similar here for uh, Moonlight Sonata as well. It's another Beethoven piece. It's another very famous Beethoven piece, and people seem to like what I did before, so I figured I'd do it again and just kind of talk about some of the things that you would want to watch out for and pay attention to when you go to learn the piece. And also there will be a link in the description of the video to the sheet music it's on IMSLP and there will be a copy of this exact sheet music that you can use in the description so if you want to use the exact same sheet music that I did here you can go ahead and feel free to do that so anyway I hope you guys enjoyed this video if you want you can go check out my channel if you haven't already I've got lots of cool reviews of pianos keyboards organs and also other cool performance videos on this piano and other neat instruments as well so if you want to go check all that out you can and if you do that thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video goodbye